All right. Well, Todd, it's great to, great to talk to you again. Why don't we quickly introduce ourselves? So uh, Todd, why don't you start? Oh yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's great to see you again as well. And uh, yeah, for those um, who may be new to InMotion, we have been around for a long time as a hosting company. Um, but underneath a lot of the end uh, customer products that we sell is actually, you know, a really robust infrastructure. And so OpenStack plays a big role for us. And so recently we uh, started offering uh, products uh, directly to the market that are OpenStack based products. And so, yeah, started out uh, 20 years ago. And uh, yeah, and I've been in that industry for, for a long, long time. So I'm one of the original founders and uh, still the CEO and president today. And um, awesome. I know, yeah, there's always a question too about kind of core values and really pertinent to this discussion is for a long time, I have been involved with uh, open source and myself got my start many years ago, late nineties, um, programming as, as it would be. And I was lucky enough to be able to take advantage of open source technologies to help me transition from being an automotive engineer into the uh, web space. And um, so I've carried that passion for open source uh, to this day. So it's one of my core values and certainly specific to this. Great. Well, that, that's wonderful. Uh, well, my name is uh, Mark Collier and um, I'm the COO at the Open Infrastructure Foundation. And previously uh, I was one of the, the folks that got the OpenStack project started when I was at Rackspace. And then we started a couple of years into that with uh, the OpenStack Foundation. And just recently we've expanded to kind of look at infrastructure overall, still very much focused on OpenStack, but uh, uh, there's a lot of open source that's part of a modern cloud today, whether it's public, private, or hybrid. So, you know, as a foundation nonprofit, you know, we're bringing different companies and people together, hundred thousand people in over 180 countries are members of our foundation and, you know, InMotion is one of our members. So just excited to, to talk to you about some of your announcements and how you're bringing open source infrastructure to the market so people can actually use it. Yeah, absolutely. No, very excited and um, always good to uh, to talk to somebody with just as much experience. So I don't, so I'm not like, oh, back in the 90s. Yeah. And um, yeah. what are you no, trying so, to say? Huh? Come on. <laughs> hey, I'm saying, I'm a little saying bit of gray. Like, I got a little gray. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, that's coming in. <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, I know today we're going to be running through uh, a lot of stuff about uh, open source and about the open stack, but you know, in our world, we're really talking specifically about private clouds. Yeah. If you wouldn't mind Mark digging in a little bit and um, why you believe organizations are turning to private cloud and, and then we'll go from there. Yeah, sure. I mean, what, what we see talking to, to different companies is that, you know, there's, there's a lot of drivers for private cloud. It's uh, security, data sovereignty are big, big drivers. Um, definitely you know, cost and, and performance. And so, you know, we just see uh, the ability to kind of customize and, and operate a cloud that's, you know, more applicable to your workloads. Those are some of the big drivers and, and we're definitely seeing growth. I mean, there's, if you look at a lot of the data out there, there's a huge amount of, of growth going on in private cloud. Um, you know, there's a lot more headlines probably about public cloud and people are starting to talk again about hybrid cloud. It was sort of talked about for a while. Now people are doing stuff with it. So the reality is, you know, we're seeing growth across all the forms of cloud computing infrastructure demand is just higher than ever. And so every sort of form of that, absolutely, definitely, including private cloud, especially I think in the last year with COVID, uh, I saw a stat recently, of something like 37% growth in uh, the number of, you know, people that were growing their private clouds, you know, because of the, those kind of new demands that are just kind of making that, that even more appealing as one of the ways to, to have cloud infrastructure. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, we, we definitely um, see those same things. And uh, you say it's one of the reasons why we were focused on OpenStack for our private cloud. And in particular for us, you know, OpenStack at its uh, core is, it really is a wonderful, wonderful product that is, you could say, fits so many use cases. But for us, like um, when, when we saw a lot of that volume and a lot of that growth going on, we also realized though, that it tended to be in the much larger organizations mm -hmm. than ourselves, let's say the, the, the in motion side of us, than what we really deal with. Um, and so for us, we were really concerned that we were seeing this great growth and volume in OpenStack and, and private clouds of all, of all sort, but it tended to be really large organizations that were able to do that and be successful with it. And so for us, we were like, hey, we really love the smaller business, the smaller teams. And so it really resonated with us to say, hey, can we actually help be part of that for the smaller teams? And so actually it's one of the kind of core reasons that we turned to OpenStack is you with OpenStack being open source, you can actually take it and make it into a use case 
that may be not as traditional for it, but that actually would address a particular market, you know? And so we saw the same growth and we were super excited about it, but we were kind of, you know, disheartened a little bit to see that it was so focused with big organizations and that maybe we could play a part in letting uh, smaller organizations uh, get a hold of OpenStack. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that um, that you make a great point, which is, you know, historically there hasn't been a lot of, you know, natural adoption in small and medium business for OpenStack, even though the benefits of private cloud are very clear and, and absolutely do apply in that market. And I think it, what, what's been missing or what, you know, small businesses have not wanted to do is sort of like, oh, download the source code, set up their own infrastructure, run it on themselves. I mean, that doesn't make sense for, for the vast majority of small businesses. So the, the benefits were there, but the cost side in terms of just people and time and focus that would be diverted from their core business just didn't make sense. And so this kind of like uh, commercial offering, the kind of, you know, productized uh, OpenStack as a service, that really is exactly, I think, what you're you're going for, if I'm, if I'm not too far off the track here. And so that that is bringing uh, OpenStack to the small business market. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, we want to make it, we want to just make it easier. It, it, I think when we look at OpenStack, and again, I'm uh, the, the biggest fan, so it's hard, it's hard for people to convince me that we shouldn't use OpenStack. So, you know, I have to preface all of my discussions. I'll go ahead that. and agree with you there. Yeah, yeah, thank you. <laughs> yeah, it makes sense. But, but, but I can, but yet we definitely have to acknowledge that it is hard. Yes. Um, like it takes expertise in networking and mm -hmm. hardware and automation and architectural design of something like this. And like being able to scope what your workloads might be. So you don't undersize or oversize. It's really hard. And so, um, when we were looking at, you know, and I'll use a funny word when I describe this, but I, when we were looking at, it, I was like, what if we could make it trivial to start up an open stack and get in there and learn the components and the services and how it ties together um, check out what it can do. And then when you're done, turn it off, but that it should be trivial to do so. Mm -hmm. And one of the big successes, I don't know, for, for me, when I look at the big successes for the mega clouds is that they made, uh, getting a hold of computing resources trivial. It was super easy. You hit the button and you have it. So, and I said, you know, can we be something close to that? I mean, this is a very, very serious system, right? Like OpenStack and all the underpinnings is, is a very, very serious system. But if we, if we could get close to that trivial idea mm -hmm. and let people try it, use it, experience it as in like, yeah, I can do this. What broader reach can OpenStack have? Uh, today, it, it's like one of the, and you, you, actually, I'll, I'll ask you this because I, I get the stats wrong, but it's big and powerful and people love it. But it does tend to be centered around really large organizations. And I was like, well, can it be even bigger if we made it more accessible to the smaller team. So yeah, actually it's probably a question back to you to, to say, I mean, again, I, I, for those who may not know OpenStack as well, I'm a huge fan and part of it is, is because of the, the vibrancy of the community. How do you see the community um, growing still? And, and give that little little outline as to like yeah. how vibrant it is. Cause I could say it, but you really know it. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's actually, you know, because it's the, the software really got started as a community, we started to build the community um, over 10 years ago now. So last year, we had kind of the 10-year the anniversary of the, the establishment of the community when there was very, very little software. But it was mostly an idea and people that wanted to work together on it as a community. And so you fast forward to today, and I think um, a lot of people may not realize that we have 8,000 developers that have contributed to the software and, you know, uh, from hundreds of organizations, even right now, after 10 years, it's one of the three most actively developed open source projects in the world in terms of mm -hmm. code that's being merged, changes being merged every day. So uh, the Linux kernel and Chromium, which is upstream of Chrome OS, Chrome browser, people are familiar with, you know, those are the only two projects out there mm -hmm. that are more active, um, even though, you know, you might hear about a lot, many, many other open source projects that are kind of in the news because something that's newer is, is in the news, right? The first three letters of news is new. So OpenStack's not new. So it's not, not as much in the news, but the adoption, the, the activity and developer community is as high as ever. And so the question is kind of like, well, why, why with something that's kind of, is it a solved problem? Why would there still be so much investment in the development? And the reason is because the demands of the workloads on infrastructure. So we're still infrastructure as a service. That's what the OpenStack community is, is going after. But if you think about AI, machine learning, the rise of containers, like applying all that to the infrastructure as a service layer, each layer uh, actually of the stack, the control plane for the last several years within OpenStack has been containerized. Take advantage of all that awesome container stuff. Um, on top, there are people that, you know, will run Kubernetes and then the workloads that are coming in with things like AI, TensorFlow, et cetera, 
you know, those, those have new requirements on the infrastructure layer below because we need to expose GPUs, FPGAs, you know, um, ARM architecture. So there's so much more work to be done, even though it's, you know, still kind of the same layer that it was, but, you know, there's so much demand for infrastructure and the underlying architectures keep changing because more people have fun stuff to run on it. So that's, that's really why you see more investment. It hasn't slowed down. I 100% agree with that. And, we, and we're seeing it um, even directly. Uh, one of the current customers that we're working with right now for non-GPU workloads, they're, they're a machine learning shop. Mm -hmm. um, they're now coming to us saying, hey, guys, what's what do you have for us? Um, and we love these new A100s out of NVIDIA, which we do love. They're very, very expensive, but we do <laughs> love them as well. And so, yeah, e even in our case right now, we're now adding the A100s as an offering inside of our product catalog because the, the, the machine learning, I mean, it's a funny thing, actually. One of the, one of the machine learning guys, they, they told me, like, you actually, in some cases, you can't get it off of the public cloud. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're so in use that you actually have to get up at 2 a.m. in order to like book your time uh, to do some of your training work. And so they're turning to us to say, hey, what do you guys have to offer? And for sure, we're listening. Now, we're not as familiar yet with um, GPU inside of OpenStack, but, you know, it's exciting to see that the community out there very much is into this. But it, let me follow that thought with a question. Yeah, what do you think we might face, I guess, when we're, we're bringing in GPUs um, and any guidance that you might have? Yeah, I mean, I think it's it, one of the things that, as I said, you know, kind of you look at where is the active development going on? I mean, that's indicative that, you know, there's challenges that are still being solved. And so, you know, you look at there's the virtualization side of it. So, you know, Nova kind of being the virtualization engine uh, management system within the OpenStack framework. So there's, you know, virtual GPU enablement. But then there's also, you know, many times that you want to actually just expose it on, on bare metal, right? So you see... Uh, I was gonna gonna kick this back to you as well. Maybe if we talk a little bit about the bare metal side of it, but within the OpenStack framework, there's a component called Ironic, and so Ironic allows you to enable this uh, kind of treat your bare metal these kind of physical servers that you have in, in mass throughout your data center in a programmatic fashion, sort of a cloud-like fashion with APIs and provisioning and being able to kind of uh, bring up new hardware, new racks, and quickly bring them online and then decommission old hardware. The whole lifecycle management of hardware that we kind of take for granted if we're just, you know, consuming clouds all day, public clouds or, or your managed service, you know, your customers can take that for granted, but you don't, you have to, to manage all that stuff. So I think in the GPU world and other sort of accelerators, uh, very much ironic as an area where there's a lot of investment going on. And then uh, last but not least, you know, I would say the Cyborg project is, is kind of a newer project within the OpenStack world that's specifically trying to expose and make it uh, easier for, for people to access kind of different types of accelerators. So mm -hmm. historically, you know, the philosophy is don't, you know, try to be somewhat, uh, create abstraction layers, right? So like we, we, we don't necessarily have a GPU framework, we have a accelerator framework. Now the most people may be using it for GPUs, but that's kind of indicative of the philosophy and the community of like, let's build something in anticipation that there may be more types of this thing going forward so we can, we can scale out. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty helpful. And definitely our two acknowledged use cases that we've now gotten back from the customers, they are saying both of those. They're saying, Hey, we want to have direct access to the GPU at the bare metal level. And, mm -hmm. um, and ironic does definitely in our system plays quite a role, both to help us provision and clean and flash bioses and all that stuff properly, like uh, good systems need to do. Um, but then it also, uh, ironic in a future release for us, will allow the customer to actually do some of that stuff themselves from within their cloud. But yeah, our two use cases is absolutely, we've got to expose the GPU easily so they can use it on the bare metal, uh, but then also slice it up. Those modern ones that the A100 does seven virtual GPUs. And that's a use case for them too, to say we're like, look, we, we'd rather have it sliced up because our workloads, we just, we don't want them in serial. We, we need them in parallel because they're a little bit smaller. So let's slice that up, put it in VMs and then shove the workload at it. So yeah, we're excited to see that. And it's great to see that there's just so much push for that um, all over. And that's really where the power of that open source uh, community comes in because like us, we're, we're not an organization like a Google or something that can throw a hundred engineers at something to figure it out. We have to go to the open source community where, yeah, everybody together is throwing a hundred engineers at it, but practically we can't do it on our own. We can only do it as a team. You know, so that for me, and I know people always ask, you know, why would you pick OpenStack? And, and that's why what's one of the core reasons I go back and it's, it is a community that believes that they can share 
that knowledge and we'll all move forward because of it. And so, yeah, we're, yeah, we're definitely excited to be part of that. And also very excited that there's a lot of other people helping us with this GPU stuff. So yeah, it's so sort of like a, you know, distributed R and D, like these are problems that uh, so many people all over the world have. And I think the geographic diversity of the OpenStack community is something that's very, uh, you know, near and dear to my heart. I mean, we have community members in you know, 180 countries and it's just, it's just incredible. I mean, we had a, we had a virtual event last year where people from over 120 countries attended. I mean, the power of, of ideas and economic opportunity that that brings to people all over the world is it's really awesome. I mean, there's nothing like open source that can, that even could possibly rival that for, for my experience. Um, and, and I guess, that's just my, my soapbox on, on open source, but I think uh, <laughs> we're on the same one. I think, you know, to get back to your, your product offerings, you know, I think you have this, uh, this flex metal offering. So maybe uh, you could talk a little bit about that um, specifically and kind of how that plays into, to, you know, as a, a way of contributing back to OpenStack with ideas and use cases as well for the community. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So the, yeah, the product itself is the, is essentially it's a hyper converged three server control plane, everything is private to the three servers. And that's kind of like your initial footprint. Um, we do, we do back the, the storage is, is Ceph as well. So in addition to OpenStack, there's a Ceph layer underneath that. Mm -hmm. Um, but we, we really focused on trying to make sure that it could be really small and it, and it's because as an entry point, it allows it to be really low cost, but it has everything that you need that you may have to have as a, as a small cloud. So sometimes people will say, well, you can train on a single box. And of course you can, but what do you, what do you, what if you need to, to, to learn how to live migrate things? Mm -hmm. What if you need to learn to knock a machine offline and figure out what to do when those things happen? And so those are only things that you can do when you actually have like a true cluster and that you're running it in the way that from a production standpoint in the long run, you actually would run it. Um, and so, yeah, so we focused on making sure that it could be small, it could be inexpensive and that we actually build by usage on an hourly basis. And so wow. this kind of aligns with the, yeah, that's what everybody goes like. On the, that seems on pretty, stack, pretty wow. disruptive for a, for a private open stack as a service. I mean, that's really as a service. It, it is as a service, you know, and, and that is the, um, when, when we looked at the, the trivial part and I said, Hey, look, if we really want people to just say, I'm going to get into this, it's got to be something that they trust is trivial. They can get into, try it, understand it, turn it off, start another one. Or even like, this is what I, what I really think is interesting for us. So when we're talking to um, a lot of public cloud providers, typically like VPS companies that are running on OpenStack, one of the first things that they say that's interesting to them is it lets them develop and adopt the new releases of OpenStack or the new releases of Ceph, maybe in this case, but the new releases of OpenStack and then also to add additional components. Like there's a ton of VPS providers out there running on OpenStack that don't today offer Kubernetes. Mm -hmm. Well, it's because it's a little bit complicated to go through the process to understand, okay, what's going to be in here? Do I understand Magnum and Octavia or if, they, if they're doing it that way? Um, do I understand it? Do I know how this is going to work? How do I bill for it? Well, guess what? You can fire up a cloud with us mm -hmm. in minutes, have that, understand how it's going to work, evaluate it, and make sure that it's right for your production environment and go through the process and then apply it back into your production environment. And so one of the ways I think, I, I really hope that that we are we can be valuable to the overall um, ecosystem now that is running and selling off of OpenStack mm -hmm. is let them develop faster and get onto the more modern stuff. So, but, and, and for sure, that's what the VPS providers that we're talking to are saying to us. They're like, wow, that's really cool. So I can spin this up, try it out. I can train my people on it. Like that's one of the challenges. Like, so it used to be, I mean, you know, the deal, it used to be like, okay, I need to develop an open stack. All right. Call my networking people, call my hardware people. Oh, we don't have hardware. Great. We got to order a box, order a box. Three months later, I have my development environment. No, this is 45 minutes, you know, 45 minutes will get you in front of this thing. And so wow. uh, for me, that's one of the big things. The other one that for me though, it really is. And we knew we wanted to be helpful, obviously, and accretive to the existing system, uh, ecosystem, but I really want to bring in new people, people that I've looked at OpenStack before. And because there's only three people in their IT team or five people, there was no way that was going to happen for them. And so mm -hmm. they just wrote it off. And instead, I think this allows them to get into it, to get involved with it and to see the power and, and to realize the most, this is a big point for me, and to realize those mega clouds, 
they are sticking it to you cost wise. <laughs> like this is just a fact, but, but sometimes you don't realize it until you get in there and you go, Whoa, why is that so expensive per VM or per compute cycle up there is way too much. Well, it's way too much because the public clouds are taking advantage of that to do it privately right now. It, it's, it's just, it's just too hard for the smaller ones. And so the smaller companies have to go to that. So they're paying, they're really paying because of something that we can change for them. We can make it more accessible. They don't need to be paying those prices. Anyways, I, yeah, I get I get going on this stuff. So I, my apologies, because it's like, it just says, it's just not a right thing for me. When I look at what's happening with the mega clouds and how they're just, com they're such a dominant force. And in many cases, because those companies themselves and their monopolies and other parts of their business, and they have this really, really powerful force. Um, and I, and I, but when I look at OpenStack, I think we can be an offset to that. Um, we don't. We as a as a group, we can challenge those mega clouds. As individual smaller businesses, it's, there's just no way it's going to happen. But as a group, we absolutely can challenge that. So, anyways, I think I, I ran through many different subjects there, but I, I can say I'm super excited mm -hmm. about being able to have this really easily available OpenStack to encourage people to join in, into this community. Yeah, no, that, that's that's awesome. I think you, you hit on a couple of really interesting points there. Like one is just the ecosystem enablement. Um, you know, I hadn't even really, really thought of that, that, that the power of this, what you're doing, not only to just kind of help people get their own private cloud, but actually people who are just trying to to bring to market uh, different flavors of OpenStack or stay more modern, or, you know, I'm sure all those VPS providers are, their customers are demanding a Kubernetes service. And if they're finding that, you know, their ability to kind of, serve those customers or that market is being held up because they can't experiment quickly have like their own sort of lab or POC or see how it works in practice, you know, with a few clicks, then that kind of this friction that's been in, in the market with OpenStack and you're helping remove that. And then kind of the other side, uh, the other kind of piece of that that you're saying, which I really find compelling is that, you know, we, there's people have talked about the cost of public clouds, it, they, it can be very, very expensive as you get, you know, uh, more reliant on it and also just being overly reliant on, on one or two providers. And, but people also talk sort of in another realm of the world about sort of the, the other, the types of costs that comes to consuming OpenStack more, less about sort of like hard costs, but more like people and expertise and time and distraction from your core, uh, you know, your core business. So that's a different form of a cost, right? And so what you're trying to do is kind of bring this cost down so people can very easily uh, instantaneously really kind of stand up their own in, in, independent sort of dedicated environment, configure it the way they want through your, you know, kind of bare metal service and pay by the hour or whatever. And, um, and then at the same time, you know, hopefully learn how to build something for production and go to the market with you, which brings down that other cost. So you're kind of like, you know, bringing the cost down in two different ways, kind of the opportunity or people costs and time uh, for OpenStack complexity, removing that complexity and making things trivial, kind of two ways of saying the same thing that you've been saying. But I, I just think that's really compelling and it's a great example, an answer to the question of how are you giving back to OpenStack? It's, this is what OpenStack has been needing. So uh, this enables more people to figure out a path to production with OpenStack and, and just to kind of, you know, end on this point for our standpoint at the foundation, you know, we really see our role as building communities that write software that runs in production. So that running in production is absolutely the, the end goal. You know, any, any community we build that doesn't build software that ultimately runs in production, you know, well, there's no point in that, you know, it's just, that's just kind of like, mm -hmm. uh, launching foundations for press releases or whatever, you know, we, we want to, to help people write software that runs in production. What you're doing as a member of our foundation is just contributing in a huge way to that end goal of getting pe more people into production, as you said, has been underutilized. Not enough people have had this opportunity to tap into the power of OpenStack because of the things that you're, you're addressing. So I think that's awesome. No, I definitely appreciate you saying that. And to be honest, I haven't articulated it in the ways that you have. And so I'm thinking like, I'll be honest, like some of this was just like, you know what? I'm really frustrated with how the smaller businesses and smaller teams don't have access to this cloud um, and to be like, even like as a system administrator today, um, you know, what is the top of your, of your game for as, as a job? Well, it's 
running these really complex things like these clouds. But the more that companies put it over on the public clouds, the less opportunity these system admins or these developers or site engineers, what the, what are they, what do they have as their, as their, as their kind of ultimate thing that they can learn and be proud of and, and produce? Well, one of them is running clouds for sure. You know, so to rewind back to it, I can't say we necessarily went after it with exactly the way that you articulated it. So I'm going to borrow that for sure. We really went after it. I'm like, we got to make this thing easier to get more people into it. Um, and we have customers today that I see them jump to the public cloud and I go, oh man, first it's, it's much harder than you think. And the security stuff that you've grown to have with us, um, you're, you're going to be reworking that and you're going to, and it's really easy to make mistakes in the public cloud that can really cost you. And, and so we said, you know what, we got to make our private cloud stuff easier because I mean, you guys know the security models and the governance models are pre-established. It makes it so much less likely you're going to have mistakes. Now you could still make mistakes. This is, this is the internet for, for better or worse, <laughs> but it, you're much less likely to make costly mistakes security wise when you have an established governance model and, and you have a security model that's already prepackaged inside of OpenStack. Um, so yeah, for, for us, we're, we're excited that I think we can fill these gaps in, inside of uh, adoption inside of OpenStack. No, that's great. And I, and I was just kind of re restating what, what you've been doing, which is awesome. So, uh, make sure I, I, I got it. It's very powerful. And I think, you know, one last question, maybe I wanted to ask was kind of, how do you uh, help make sure that the features your customers care about kind of, you know, get worked on in, in the developer community? Like how, how do you think about that? You know, that uh, it's a pretty interesting challenge because, uh, traditionally most companies are going to implement it with like one really large open stack. And in our case, what we're doing is many, many small open stacks. And so we even encourage the customer, particularly like actually we're on the security side is you often have workloads inside of your company that have different security needs. So easy example would be, okay, I'm, I'm storing credit cards. I'm processing stuff and storing credit cards. Do, do you really want to put that workload uh, in storage in the same cloud, uh, as maybe other general stuff. And in our case, you just spin up two different clouds because it's trivial to do so. And one of them has a very lockdown model, very, 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 very small uh, access levels and things like that. Whereas then your other one is, is designed for those uh, general uses. And so um, rewinding your question of like, how do we make sure that like our needs are, are there? A, a lot of actually what people are asking for are similar to what the big clouds are providing. And so they are saying to us, wait a minute, I want database as a service. Oh, okay. We can do that. You know, the big clouds, the big users, they did that already for us. So we can actually just, we have to automate it, you know, and make sure that it shows up inside of your cluster right for you. And, and we have a good documentation so you can just get going from it. Um, you know, maybe we have to automate some of the presets so that it's easier for them to just go right in there and start using it. But in some cases, we very much align with the, um, with all of the big users out there because the big users, they get the advantage usually that usually they have the advantage because they are big enough to make it useful for them and they can do those tweaks and, and, and fits. So our kind of contribution part of it is, is just to make sure that those big users and how they've implemented it, we can build on top of it with just some basic post setup of the cloud automation mm -hmm. to get it like easier to use. So it actually, in some cases, it aligns very well. Um, I can say though, definitely whenever I was talking to my friends, either are open stack people or, or, you know, infrastructure people, and we were kind of giving them the idea very, this is, you know, maybe a year ago now to say, Hey, we're going to automate open stack in 45 minutes. And they're like, no, you're not. You're crazy. Like, <laughs> that's never going to work. And you're going to hyper converge it at the same time with Seth. Like, it's not going to work. Why, why are you going after that? You're a fool. And I'm like, no, well, first off we have. We have a great, great team here at InMotion. I can't say, you know, enough about them. Super talented people that also believe in the open source world. And so I think they also looked at this for sure in, in our company too. I got a couple of people are like that. We shouldn't do it that way. You're crazy. We shouldn't do that. But, but what I can say is that team who does believe in, in this, in being able to help these smaller businesses be successful and believes in open source, they found the way. 
they figured out how to get all these things to happen in that short a period of time. And so for me, when I was looking at that is it is going to be a challenge, I think, to make sure that the things that we're doing are visible enough, I guess, where the community might pay attention to say, hey, I will fix that because, you know, I might not need that or it's not really my use case, but I know that these guys are doing it. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we're get, maybe we're lucky enough to get some of these bigger organizations to use our system for development purposes. And then it, they're going to be like, oh, it doesn't work on them. I'll fix that. So maybe that'll work out for yeah, us. Yeah, that, that'd be great. Yeah, that might be great. But but I think for me, as I have a great belief in the team that we have and that we will um, call it Ansible. I'd love to you know give a shout out to them because that is a mm -hmm. big that's a big part of our success. And that's the close that we use that a lot. So I think one of our our key steps into this is to make sure we're putting aside proper time to upstream the things that we're learning um, and to ask the right questions and to be detail oriented about what we have noticed so that there can be adjustments in call Ansible. Um, but yeah, I'd love, yeah, again, shout out to them. That was a huge part of our success is we were able to build on, on call Ansible and we will be certain that we return that um, back into the, to the community by doing things upstream and being very detailed with them. So. Yeah, I think the, the short answer is we will work hard to be noticed and to be part of that community with our own giving back, which I hope hopefully will help us earn the, the spot so that people do pay attention to it. Good, good. Well, I think, you know, this has been great just in terms of a uh, la la few last thoughts, you know, what are some of the things that really are important to you about kind of working on open source, bringing that infrastructure to market? You know, we kind of, we covered a lot of ground, but I'm just kind of curious, you know, is there... Any last thoughts on, you know, why this is so important to you personally to work on this every day? I think I'd mentioned very early on in the conversation is, you know, I grew up with this, so to speak, you know, I grew up in the open source world and, uh, you know, I started with, uh, Perl CGI's and SHTML and on a Unix box, you know, setting up Apache and MSQL, uh, and, you know, and I, and I've continued throughout my career being close to that stuff. And, you know, and we're, we're big fans, like all the way on the kind of the other side of the smaller customers, like WordPress, we've been closely tied in with WordPress for many, many years. Mm -hmm. Um, use it, use all these things personally. Um, and so for me, I think it's just, um, it's not really about, you know, making money. It's not that I love being part of those communities that, that have both a, a, a philosophy and, uh, and, a and a reason for doing things that are, that are besides things like dollars. So I just love being in the open source community, I guess, in, in short. Yeah. No, so I, that's an interesting, you know, thank you for that question. I'll, I'll throw that question back at you if you don't mind is, yeah, what, uh, what are the things maybe we didn't get a chance to talk about today that you're interested in highlighting? Yeah, I mean, I agree. And I kind of a similar background that, you know, kind of WordPress and the LAMP stack, kind of the, those were some of the early open source um, things I was exposed to. And I just saw the power of people coming together, no matter what country or company they were in. And that's really been um, the philosophy that we've, we've put into the open stack and the open infrastructure foundation. And we're looking at the next decade of open source infrastructure. And, you know, I, I just very passionate about the fact that it's very inclusive in the sense that, you know, again, whatever country you're in or company you work for, you can be in a part of it. Your ideas, you know, will uh, be listened to. You have an opportunity to contribute to the advancement of this fundamental tool. I mean, these infrastructure automation tools, these cloud tools, people are relying on them for every problem in the world we're trying to solve today, you know, from biotechnology to, to every kind of research and development, you know, CERN uses OpenStack, the Large Hadron Collider to try to find, you know, the, the, what happened at the Big Bang and the missing 95% of yeah. mass. So every really cool, interesting problem we're trying to solve relies on this access to this technology. And so giving more people the ability to influence where the technology goes, but also giving everyone in the world a chance to have access to the technology is just really important to me personally. I think it's the right thing. It's the best way to lift more people up economically and with opportunity and just, just to have more good ideas coming in. And I'm just really grateful that, uh, what you're doing there in motion just makes it even more accessible to more people. So super excited for, for what y'all are working on. No, I really appreciate that. Yep. And, uh, you're, you're singing my tunes. That's for <laughs> sure. I think, uh, and it is, it's a great thing to be in that type of community. So yeah, yeah. Again, so I, I guess I could say probably in closing is yeah, just, uh, for OIF is I definitely appreciate the, the work that you guys have done for so long and you personally for so many years, starting all the way back rack space times, um, it is, we, we built something from what you guys have been gracious enough to contribute back to the community. So thank you, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Nice talking Absolutely. to you today. 
All right, real pleasure. <laughs>